Welcome everybody to today's webinar and side event to the Biological Weapons Convention meetings of experts. We're delighted to have so many of you with us. My name is Dr. Philippa Lenzos. I'm a senior lecturer and co-director of the Center for Science and Security Studies at King's College London in the United Kingdom. And with me today is Dr. Greg Koblenz, my co-lead on the project we're going to tell you about. Greg is an um, associate professor at George Mason University in the United States, and he serves as director of the Biodefense Graduate Program at George Mason. Also with us is Joseph Rogers. Joseph is a graduate student in the Biodefense Program at George Mason. He's also linked to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where he acts as program manager on their project on nuclear issues. So you'll hear from both Greg and uh, Joseph in a minute. Um, but first, I wanted to give you some background on our project, Mapping Maximum Biological Containment Labs Globally. Could we have the next slide, please, Isabel? So our project has put together a comprehensive resource on biosafety level four labs around the world. We felt that this was important given recent debates about biosafety level four labs and biosafety. We also thought it was important um, given the um, importance of these types of labs for public health and biodefense purposes. And we also thought it was important given the lack of knowledge generally among the public, media and policymakers about these particular kinds of labs. Now, as you will all be aware, Clinical work and scientific studies on pathogens are important for public health, biomedical advances, and for disease prevention. But as you will be equally aware, especially in this forum, some of these activities also pose significant risks. So work with high-risk pathogens carries substantive safety risks to lab workers, but also to the wider society and the environment. There are also security risks, so pathogens or other related material could, for instance, be stolen from a lab and lab insiders could use their knowledge, skills and access for malevolent purposes. And there's also a security risk that scientific knowledge and methods used by lab workers to understand and manipulate the properties of pathogens for public health purposes could be repurposed by others in order to cause harm. Now, high risk pathogen work also carries certain risks to peace and international security. So increases in the number of facilities and researchers working with dangerous pathogens may contribute to a perception that capacities to weaponize biology are increasing. And this may in turn provide justification for a country to initiate or expand an offensive biological warfare program. Next slide, please, Isabel. So all of these risks mean that extremely high levels of safety and security protection must be applied and that work with dangerous pathogens must be conducted responsibly. Maximum containment labs, commonly referred to as BSL-4 labs, but they also have different names. Um, so these labs are designed and built to work safely and securely with the most dangerous bacteria and viruses. There is, however, currently no requirement to report these facilities internationally. And there's no international entity that's mandated to collect such information and provide oversight at a global level. So we wanted our study to start addressing this gap by developing an interactive web-based map of biosafety labs uh, or biosafety level four labs globally. We also wanted to document bio-risk management policies in place at these labs in order to identify gaps in national and international oversight of biosafety, biosecurity, and dual-use research. Uh, a quick word on some practicalities of our study. So we've used the WHO lab biosafety manual definition of maximum containment. So we are conscious there are some uh, variations in national biosafety specifications, but in general, we take BSL-4 labs as designed to work with risk group four pathogens that can cause serious disease and be readily transmitted from one individual to another, and for which effective treatment and preventive measures are not usually available. 
We restricted the scope of our study to labs working on pathogens that can affect humans, including zoonotic diseases. Um, so labs that only work on pathogens causing disease in animals were excluded. So those are not covered in our uh, study. And we also excluded mobile BSL-4 labs. Our research is primarily based on open sources. We also consulted an international group of experts for feedback, and we gave all of the labs on our list an opportunity to review our information about them and to provide feedback. So the map on the slide is the result of our study. So on the map, you will see lots of these uh, little yellow dots. When you click onto one of them, they, are, they, they stand for individual labs. So if you click on one of them, you will find a brief characterization of that lab, as well as indicators of good biosafety and biosecurity practices in the countries where the labs are located. Slide, please, Isabel. Our study and our findings have all been written up in this policy brief, which is available on the globalbiolabs.org website. So you can go through the material in your own time. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Greg, who will take you through some of the key messages that came out of our analysis of all of these different labs. Over to you, Greg. Thanks, Philippa. Uh, as uh, we stated, this is the most comprehensive assessment of the number of BSL-4 labs around the world. Um, can we get the next slide, please? Uh, our research identified uh, 61 BSL-4 labs in operation, under construction, or planned. Um, the number has grown a little bit since we originally gave this presentation just uh, a few months ago. The greatest concentration of these labs are in Europe with 25, followed by Asia with 15, North America with 14, Australia with four, and Africa with three labs. Given recent concerns about biosafety, it's worth noting that more than three quarters of these labs are located in urban areas. The number of BSL-4 labs around the world has been growing steadily. For the 42 labs for which we have dates on which they were established, half became operational in the past 10 years. And we expect more countries to seek these types of labs in the wake of COVID-19 as part of a renewed emphasis on pandemic preparedness and response. This is part of the reason why we think it's important to put in place higher national and international standards for bio-risk management now. Now let me turn things over to Joseph Rogers, who will provide a demo of our website, globalbiolabs.org. Great. Hello, everyone. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how our website works. So I'm going to talk about some of the website's key features that were alluded to uh, a little bit ago talk about the map, go through three examples, and talk a little bit about some of the methodology that we used. Um, so beginning with uh, a few of the key features to note on the website, when you arrive at globalbiolabs.org, this is the homepage. You'll see that you can access our map, the policy brief that was just alluded to. Um, you could access them either at the top or just scrolling down a little bit. You could also look at the uh, in the news tab to see some of the media references that our website has, has got. Um, so if you click on the policy brief link, then you'll go to this page and you can download the report or just click on this image to download the report. If you click on the in the news tab, then you'll see some of the media mentions, little excerpt, and you can sort of click our uh, read more links to see uh, a variety of, of sources ranging from you know, international sources uh, that sort of look at the website. Um, so with some of those other features aside, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the map, which is the exciting feature of the website. So when you arrive at the homepage, you can access the map by clicking here, going down a little bit and hitting view map. And that will take you to uh, this page. And you know, there's all of these uh, little icons that represent the various BSL-4 labs that we've identified. Um, I want to walk through three examples of individual lab entries that we have. Um, and I guess I'd, I'd note that we categorized all of our labs into four different sort of types of, of lab ownership. So there's defense labs, there's public health labs, there's university labs, and private labs. Um, so I'm going to walk through three different examples of, of, of labs that are owned by different entities. Um, and we're going to first start with uh, a lab in Australia. 
So when you navigate over to this sort of categories divided by continents over here, we're going to go to Australia. And I'd just like to note really quickly uh, before I go forward that if you sort of hover over each of these entries, they pop up on the map. But if you zoom out, you'll see now the world only has four labs. Um, and that's because you've selected one category. So if you're looking in the map and you only see you know, a handful of labs, then you'll have to go back uh, to, the, to the home page and reselect from, from here. Um, so with that aside, uh, going back forward, uh, we're going to Australia and we're going to look at the uh, Australian Center for Disease Preparedness. Um, and you can see this is kind of what a typical entry looks like. So you click on the lab, you'll see that we have a, a satellite imagery base layer uh, that drops a pin where the approximate location of the lab is. And on the left hand side, we have a variety of information over here about the lab. So we tried to grab a picture of the lab where that was publicly available. We have the name of the lab. Uh, in cases where uh, the, the name has changed, we tried to grab that information as well. We've provided a little bit of information uh, about the sort of location of the lab, the address where we could. Um, and then we provided two types of, of information. We provided information about the lab itself as well as information about the sort of biosafety and uh, biosecurity of sort of both the lab and the national uh, level that the, that the lab sits in. So we provide institutional affiliation. Um, we have a link to the website where that was possible. So you can grab this and copy it and paste it into your own browser. Um, we have links to the lab's publications where the lab sort of provided that on their own website. Um, we have the sort of types of lab, and I've mentioned there, there are four. So there's public health, university, defense, and private. Uh, we have the date that the BSL-4 was established, the status. Some of these are operational and some of these are planned, which we'll see a little bit about later. Um, we have the approximate size of the BSL-4 space. Um, and then we have some information about the sort of biosafety uh, and biosecurity risk reduction measures that the lab or the country that the lab sits in has, has undertaken. So we looked at whether the lab has sort of implemented ISO 35001, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, right now, no country has ISO 3, or no lab has ISO 35001. Uh, we looked at whether the sort of country has national or international biosafety association membership, their national, i.e. GBBR memberships, uh, whether they have a national dual use policy legislation in place, their NTI global health security index, biosafety and biosecurity rankings, which we categorize as high, medium or low. And then we provided a link where publicly available to the national BWC confidence building measures submissions. So that's kind of a typical lab entry here. Um, and we're going to go back now and take a look at a second type of lab. So we're going to go click the back button twice back to the sort of overarching list of categories. And this time we're going to take a look at a defense lab in Europe and uh, it's going to be a Czech lab. So, you know, one thing to note here is that we have all of the sort of European labs that we've identified. And I'd just like to note that um, we, for the purposes of sort of splitting the world up, have put all of the Russian labs in Europe. So um, just categorically something to note. Um, so we're going to go to the uh, a, a Czech lab, uh, the Department uh, for Biological Defense, which is um, owned by the Military Institute of Health. And so here you'll see that we have the sort of satellite imagery base layer with uh, the picture over here. Uh, we have the same sort of standard information that I talked about before. Um, you'll see that this one is not quite as filled out as the former. There's no link to publications because that they didn't provide that on their website. Um, however, this is, you know, it's a defense lab. So we've provided that information here. You can see that we've uh, given access to their website um, and the same sort of stock information uh, about uh, the you know, size of the BSL-4 space and then the biosafety uh, and biosecurity risk reduction measures have been identified over here. 
And so finally, the third lab that I'd like to go through is uh, a university lab, and that's going to be in Asia. So we're going to go look at the, uh, the Nagasaki University BSL-4. So when we select that from the down menu over here, you'll see that we've uh, once again sort of identified the location. However, you'll note that this one is, uh, it's a university lab, but it's plant. Um, so obviously we don't have links to publications because it's sort of not operational right now. Um, so this kind of gives you a flavor for what uh, the entries in our map look like overall. And uh, I hope that you sort of enjoy playing around and, and learning about the different labs through, uh, through our map here. But I'd like to conclude by talking a little bit about some of the, the methodology and resources that we used. Um, and you can find some of these key sources of information um, by navigating to our website, uh, going to the sort of bar on the top and selecting resources. Um, so you'll see that we've sort of provided a list of some of our, uh, our resources that we used here. Um, we sort of began our research by grabbing the information that we could from the BWC confidence building measures. And so we provided a link to the document here. Um, so after we'd scraped all of the publicly available information from, from there, we moved on to a variety of other sort of international sources uh, that we could grab data about bsl 4s from. So we looked at 1540 reports. We found a WHO report that listed uh, biosafety level four labs. We also looked at countries' uh, joint external evaluations and grabbed some of the data that we could from there. And after we had sort of got the information that we could from this sort of international institution level uh, resources that were available, we took a look at academic literature. Um, and so I provided a, a, a few links to uh, you know, academic resources that we used. One uh, in particular, the, the high containment report that is linked down here um, by Gigi Granval had a list of PSL4s that we sort of looked at and compared with uh, you know, our, our list. Um, so we looked, you know, at a variety of academic literature to sort of help create our sort of universe of labs. Um, and so once we had all of the labs that we you know, thought we had identified, we reached out to our academic contacts and asked them whether they, you know, had anything else to add. And then as uh, Flip Out noted, we also reached out to the labs themselves with the information that we had about that lab. We found points of contact within the lab sent them the information and many replied back with, uh, you know, either yes or, you know, mod slight modifications to the data that we had. So it was, you know, very useful. Um, I guess one last thing that I'd like to note about the website is that as you're going through this, obviously this is a sort of open source project. Um, and as you're going through uh, and looking at the entries in our map, if you do notice anything that you think is wrong or needs correction or you know information that you have that you think might be valuable on the map that fits in our categories then please don't hesitate to reach out at global biolabs uh, project at gmail.com which is at the bottom of every web page so please do reach out to us with any information that you have uh, that you think like belongs on our map in uh, our categories or any changes that you have so with that I'm going to turn it back over to Greg Terrific. So I'm just going to provide a, a summary of some of the key findings from our analysis of the BSO-4 labs around the world. So um, first, most of these labs, about 60%, are government-run public health institutions. Uh, an equal number of these labs, about 20% each, are run by either universities or by biodefense agencies. Uh, all these labs are used to either diagnose infections with highly lethal and transmissible pathogens, or used to conduct research on these pathogens in order to develop new medical countermeasures and diagnostic tests, or to improve our scientific understanding of how these pathogens work. About 80% of these labs focus on human health, while 11% focus on animal health, and the rest work on both human and animal health. Virtually all the pathogens that are studied in these maximum containment labs are zoonotic, meaning they can cause illness in both humans and animals. So the difference between these labs is less the type of pathogens they're studying and more in the population that the lab is seeking to protect. I should also note, we did not include in our study any labs that work only with pathogens that affect only animals. Uh, next slide, please. 
while large basal four labs get most of the media attention, the reality is that most of these labs are actually relatively small. Of the 44 labs that we have data on, half are under 200 square meters in size. This is uh, less than half the size of a professional basketball court. And that lab size may include auxiliary spaces and equipment like chemical showers, animal rooms, and autoclaves, in addition to the hot zone where work with live agents is actually conducted. Uh, one quarter of the BSL-4 labs have more than 1,000 square meters of lab space, and the rest are somewhere in the middle. Next slide, please. In addition to collecting information about these maximum containment laboratories, we also want to understand the bioresk management policies and practices in these labs and in their host countries. One of the most important findings was that only about one quarter of countries with BSL-4 labs received high scores for biosafety and biosecurity as measured by the Nuclear Threat Initiative's Global Health Security Index. The Global Health Security Index measures whether countries have legislation, regulations, oversight agencies, policies, and training on biosafety and biosecurity. This means there's a lot of room for improvement for countries to develop more comprehensive systems of virus management. Also, only about 40% of these countries are members of the International Experts Group of Biosafety and Biosecurity Regulators, which is a form of national regulatory authorities to share best practices on biosafety and biosecurity. Probably the biggest gap we found is that none of the maximum containment labs we identified have signed up for the international standard for biorisk management known as ISO 35001, which was established in 2019. ISO 35001 requires labs to take a management systems approach to biosafety and biosecurity, which enables an organization to identify, assess, and mitigate risks and evaluate the effectiveness of this approach over time. This approach is based on a continual improvement model that integrates biosafety and biosecurity comprehensively at every level of the organization. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, only three of the 23 countries with BSL-4 labs have national policies that provide oversight of dual-use research, which is research conducted for peaceful scientific purposes that could be misused. This means that the vast majority of countries with maximum containment labs do not regulate so-called gain-of-function research, which involves intentionally modifying a pathogen to give it new characteristics, such as enhanced lethality or transmissibility. Since gain-of-function research is expected to increase as governments and labs seek to identify future pandemic risks, this gap in national and international oversight is worrisome. It should also be noted that dual use research and gain of function research can also be conducted in labs with lower levels of biosafety, and these labs should also be subject to oversight. We're not trying to say that all BSL-4 labs engage in gain of function research, but we're noting a disconnect between countries with the most advanced biomedical research capabilities and the lack of sufficient safeguards to ensure that such capabilities are used safely, securely, and responsibly. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? And I will turn the podium back over to Flippa. Thanks, Greg. Hi again, everyone. So we've now got to the key recommendations and policy implications that are coming out of our study. And we have several of them um, based on this particular study, as well as our work in this area more broadly um, that you know, addresses safety and security risks. Um, and risks to international peace and security of working with dangerous pathogens. So some of our um, recommendations are focused at the local lab level. So BSL-4 labs, we feel, should be working to cultivate a culture of biosafety, biosecurity, and responsible research with high risk pathogens. We are, of course, not the only ones in the world who think this. There are many out there. I'm sure many of you uh, watching uh, are also of that view. Now, of course, we recognize that this doesn't just apply to BSL-4 labs. Lower containment level labs should also be nurturing a culture of safe, secure, and responsible working practices. Uh, this should encompass all levels from students and technicians to principal investigators to lab directors and and, and management more broadly. It's also important to stress that developing a culture of safe, secure, and responsible working practices is not a one-off event. It's not a checkbox that you can do. It's really a continual effort um, uh, at improving what, what you've got in place. On a national level, we emphasize the importance of ensuring that all countries, but particularly countries where high-risk pathogen work is carried out, have um, laws and regulations in place that maintain oversight of national BSL-4 labs and that require comprehensive risk assessments of proposed research for safety, security, and use activities 
with significant potential to be repurposed to cause harm. Now, in addition to national laws and regulations on bio-risk management, countries and the BSL-4 labs within should also implement and share best practices, as well as participate in peer reviews of practices in other BSL-4 labs. And we've had, of course, several good examples of peer reviews uh, within the framework, framework of the BWC. We also emphasize that countries with BSL-4 facilities must provide complete, regular, and transparent reporting under the annual confidence building measures of the Biological Weapons Convention and under UN Security Council Resolution 1540. That'll be nothing new to uh, people in this forum. Uh, at the international level, we recommended that structures be put in place to systematically register and oversee maximum containment facilities. As I said at the beginning, there currently is no such body with, with that kind of mandate. Um, we also recommend that internationally recognized guidelines governing very high risk and dual use work be developed. Let me focus on this last point about structures to be put in place to systematically register and oversee BSL-4 labs. As, as, as Greg mentioned in his notes, we expect more countries to build these labs in the wake of COVID-19 as part of a renewed emphasis on pandemic preparedness and response. In addition, gain of function research with coronaviruses, as well as other zoonotic pathogens with pandemic potential, is likely to increase as scientists seek to better understand these viruses and to assess the, risk, the risks that they pose of jumping from animals to humans or becoming transmissible between humans. Now, these trends make it increasingly urgent to put in place higher national but also international standards to address the safety and security risks of working with dangerous pathogens. A good place to start would be for BSL-4 labs and other labs that conduct research with hazardous pathogens is to adopt the recently developed international standard for bio-risk management known as ISO 35001. As many of you will know, the International Organizations for Standards, often called ISO, develops environmental safety and other standards for a wide array of products and processes, from information security to uh, child safety, seats, um, to music festivals. So in 2019, the organization released ISO 35001. It's a standard on bio-risk management for laboratories that work with dangerous pathogens. Rather than focusing on scientific hardware, the standard emphasizes commitments by top management to provide adequate resources to prioritize and communicate biosafety and biosecurity policy, to train staff, to establish performance expectations. The standard also stresses the need for continual improvement of practices and processes to determine the cause of incidents and other issues, to correct problems so they don't reoccur, and to identify opportunities for improvement, and finally to recognize and award improvement. We believe all labs engaging in high-risk research should seek to implement this new standard, not just BSL-4 labs. The standard is relatively, in our view, low hanging fruit since it has already been negotiated and is sitting on the shelf. So it can be adopted fairly quickly. We think that creating the sort of consistent process for handling pathogens and biological materials underlying the standard and which places safety at the center of all management levels across laboratories would be a big step towards reducing the risk of future accidents. Members of the BWC have supported the adoption of standard processes to reduce bio-risk. At the MSP in 2020, several countries, including Austria, Belgium, um, Chile, France, Germany, Iraq, Ireland, Netherlands, Spain, and Thailand, supported the establishment of the ISO standard because they noted industrial standards can help countries implement their treaty obligations to prevent the misuse of biology and biotechnology on their territory. So this is true. One of the key outstanding issues, however, is developing appropriate certification. 
So ISO 35001 uses third party validation. The question is who is going to uh, validate or certify that the slabs are following the um, standard. Now we see several approaches for how to implement that, all with advantages and disadvantages. And, um, a, oh, slide please, Isabel. And we've written them up in this publication. And um, Greg is quickly going to run you through uh, our thinking on that. Over to you, Greg. Thanks, Philippa. So the first option is to rely on national regulators to act as a third party. Uh, but this would likely have limited credibility internationally. So we focus our attention in the article on international mechanisms for providing third party um, certification of the ISO 35001 standard. So one uh, alternative is for the international experts group uh, of biosafety and biosecurity regulators to take on this role. Uh, this already existing form for national regulators shares best practices um, currently um, and has 11 member countries, which is, uh, constitutes about 40% of the countries that have BSO-4 labs. Uh, under our proposal, the membership of this group could be expanded uh, to more countries that have BSO-4 labs and its mission can be enlarged to incorporate certification of the new ISO standard uh, in their mission. Uh, it might be more viable for um, government-run labs to have a standalone international body like the International Atomic Energy, uh, Energy Agency, or the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons to monitor implementation of the new ISO standard. Uh, Kazakhstan recently submitted a detailed proposal for an international agency for biosafety uh, as a working paper to MX5 uh, during this uh, um, series of um, meeting of experts under the BWC. However, negotiating over a new international body is no small feat, especially in the current geopolitical environment, and this option would likely take a long time to implement. There is, however, an international organization that already conducts limited biosafety checks on labs, the World Health Organization. Uh, every two years, the WHO coordinates biosafety and biosecurity inspections of uh, the two labs in the United States and Russia that maintain samples of the virus that calls smallpox. The WHO inspection program could be expanded to certify lab compliance with this new ISO standard. Uh, separately, the WHO also conducts inspections of vaccine and medical device manufacturers to make sure that they are in compliance with uh, other international standards for good laboratory and good manufacturing practices. At the very least, these programs could be served as a model for a more direct WHO role in um, certifying uh, that laboratories are uh, conducting their operations safely, securely, and responsibly. Uh, another option is for the WHO to organize peer certification by an international team of government and non-government experts along the lines of the peer review visits that some countries have conducted under the BWC in recent years. These visits have been distinct from one another, but they all share the overarching objective, objective of building confidence in the safety and security of lab, lab activities and to ensure that the research carried out is done so responsibly and transparently. This type of visit not only builds a deeper understanding of the biosafety and biosecurity systems in place uh, and their cultures of the organizations, but also goes beyond examining the text of laws and regulations to gain a deeper understanding of the political and legal institutions that govern these labs and the administrative capacity of governments and labs to exercise this bio-risk oversight function. Such exchanges also encourage the formation of an ever-widening international network of qualified experts. So the WHO could use these peer review visits as a model for organizing peer certification. It might even make sense to conduct jointly organized peer reviews by the WHO and the BWC's implementation support unit. Each of these options would represent a significant improvement in lab safety and security. Implementing the ISO standards would also lead to the creation of transparent and credible evidence in the event of an accident or incident. Labs would have a standardized paper trail of their procedures and practices. In the event of something like a lab accident or even an unusual disease outbreak in the community around the lab, uh, these labs could provide these records to national or international authorities for um, inspection, fostering transparency and assisting with the emergency response and management. Now, ISO 35001 is not a panacea. It's not a substitute for national and international legislation regulation, but currently BSO-4 labs and other labs that handle hazardous pathogens or conduct hazardous research operate under very different safety and security standards and practices, depending on what country they're located in. And therefore they pose a risk that needs to be addressed by a more comprehensive approach. Next slide, please. So uh, that is uh, our, our presentation on the uh, website and our policy report. Uh, we now uh, welcome your questions and ask that you submit them via the Q&A function that you can find on the bottom of the Zoom screen. 
Thanks for that. Um, Greg, we've actually already got a couple of uh, questions in. Um, one, uh, thanks us for the good data and timely webinar. Thank you uh, for that. Um, one asks, um, do BSF4 labs located in non-urban areas work on more dangerous pathogens? Um, and I think the answer to that is not necessarily. Um, the vast majority of BSL-4 labs are in urban centers, and so um, they work on the whole range of um, dangerous pathogens that you find in hazard group four. The question continues, aside from access to an educated human resource, what other factors have contributed to BSL-4 labs being built in major urban centers where danger to public health may be highest due to proximity? Well, I think there's a, a whole range of factors that are taken into account when you consider where to locate a BSL-4 facility, um, one of which is certainly the safety of the people around, but there will be others like uh, the expertise you need to run these facilities, the technical expertise of uh, lab technicians, of researchers. So generally they are located in places where you have conglom conglomerations of this kind of uh, expertise. So those are, I think, uh, a couple of the key factors. And of course, there will be all kinds of more local um, factors impinging on decisions um, as well. Greg, Joseph, do you wanna answer some of the other questions? Uh, sure, there's a uh, question here about which are the two privately owned BSL-4 labs. Uh, one of those labs is the uh, Riken Bioresource Center uh, located in Japan, uh, and the other is the um, uh, Texas Biomedical Research Institute uh, located in the United States. So um, th these are, um, as we said earlier, there are only two privately owned BSL-4 labs. The rest are government-run, either um, public health institutions, uh, defense agencies, or there are also a number of university labs. Uh, there's also a question here about um, BSL-4 labs in South America and the rest of Africa. And uh, based on our research, there, there aren't any BSL-4 labs in South America that work on uh, zoonotic pathogens that, that affect humans. Um, there's quite a work done on uh, pathogens that are dangerous to, to animals, uh, especially in, in Brazil, but those don't qualify as BSL-4 labs under um, our definition uh, and based on the WHO uh, criteria. Uh, likewise, in, in Africa, there are a handful of labs, as we as we said, but uh, th there's just uh, three that are um, we're able to currently find. And if again, if if other uh, researchers, individuals um, have knowledge about uh, other BSL four labs that we missed in South America or Africa or other or other places, please again contact us through the website so we can make uh, this map and this inventory as comprehensive as possible. Thanks. Um, Johannes, uh, thanks for your uh, kind comments about our um, study being informative and, and forward looking. Um, you ask, um, or you point out that I said there's no mandate to collect data on BSL-4 labs. Um, and you ask why are they not reported to the BWC through the confidence building measures? Um, I would say that um, the majority of countries do report their BSL-4 labs through uh, the CBMs of the BWC. Of course, we're still not, the BWC is still not universal, uh, but near universal. Uh, so most countries should be doing so. Um, of course, not all countries do. Um, there are many countries who say actually the submitting information under the confidence building measures is a voluntary measures. There will be many other countries uh, and experts, myself included, who say, actually, uh, you know, you've made political commitments to do so, so you should be doing so. It's not voluntary to do so. But uh, at the ground level, there are differences in, um, in, in, in which countries do report under the CBMs. Um, luckily, as I said, most BSL-4s are uh, submitted under the, the CBMs, but the CBMs are actually information um, 
going between states' parties. So these CBMs are not analyzed by an international body. There's no international body that keeps an oversight of the sort of information that is contained within the CBMs. The CBMs are merely information, um, means of providing information state to state. And so uh, you could imagine that some sort of mandate could be added to the Biological Weapons Convention, ISU, to do some of that analysis. Um, whether or not we want the emphasis to be on the security aspect or this, which it would be if it went through the EWC ISU is a different question. So there are different possibilities of finding an appropriate international body that should be monitoring um, the, uh, or keeping an oversight of these kinds of labs and, and keeping a record of, of their number as they are continually growing. Um, there was one other question I also just wanted to um, uh, address, which links to this, is, and that was, um, will this study mandate into a global policy and uh, legislations by all countries? Well, <laughs> that would be very nice, but I, uh, I doubt it. Uh, I mean, we have to be realistic. Um, what we're hoping our study will do is to present some empirical data, provide some information so we're all working, uh, on the basis of the same data, um, and then also to stimulate a policy discussion about how we can best regulate these kinds of facilities um, in order to make sure that the work that's being done in them is safe, uh, secure, and responsible. So um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, I One more thing that I don't think we actually said in the presentation was that We've just covered BSL-4 labs here. This um, study was uh, commissioned with a very, um, by my university, this is uh, all university academically funded work, um, but on a very short time frame because we wanted to provide some of this information to the World Health Assembly when it met back in May. So that was one of our target audiences was the World Health Assembly and equally the other audience is the Biological Weapons Convention and that these are the two typical target audiences for work in this area, right? The health world and the security world. So the piece of work was commissioned very late on a, uh, on a short timeline. And so uh, what we tried to do in order to make the project manageable was um, to <laughs> narrow it down. So this is a project that only looks at BSL-4 labs. Well, well we, we're not trying to say that these are the only labs we need to worry about, or that these are the only labs that need to have safe, secure, and responsible research in them. And so uh, this is really just as a way to kind of uh, start this process of mapping the kinds of containment facilities um, that are there globally. So um, with that, over to Joseph, Greg, for any other answers to questions that have come in. Thanks. Yeah. I guess if I could add one thing to, to Flippa's excellent comments on the um, BWC CDMs, you know, I, of course there's, you know, voluntary submissions and there's not really, you know, overarching governance as, as, as Flippa said, but, um, you know, many countries submit their CBMs privately and so they're not publicly available. Um, we were able to gather a lot of data from the publicly available CBMs, but, you know, one probably fairly simple transparency and confidence building measure that states that are submitting their CBMs can take is to make sure that they're submitting them publicly so that academic research uh, such as this in the future can um, you know, reference that, that information. There's another question here I see um, on the what the Kazakh proposal to establish a new international body to monitor lab standards uh, is about when and why was it put forward? Well, um, this was something that was put forward originally to the uh, General Assembly uh, at the UN in New York uh, last year, yeah, about a year ago in, in September, October last year. Um, we've seen a lot more um, a description of what that kind of um, international body would do. Uh, 
in the working paper to this series of um, meetings of experts under the BWC. Um, and so for a comprehensive insight into what, they, what the, the proposal is, uh, I would refer you to go to the um, working paper um, I think it's under uh, MS, MX5, so the fifth and last uh, meeting of experts. And you'll see uh, a working paper there um, outlining what they think. But in short, it's essentially there to establish an inter international body uh, rooted within the BWC, but liaising with the WHO. So again, combining the security and, and health worlds that is a little bit like the IAEA is for the nuclear world, or a little bit like the OPCW is the Organization for Prohibition, the o OPCW, Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons is on the chemical side. Uh, so it's this implementing body essentially um, of the convention that would have oversight over these sorts of activities. And it certainly is um, a uh, uh, addressing a major gap in international structures um, and uh, is certainly welcome as a suggestion and as a start of a conversation about how best uh, we can address that gap internationally. Uh, there's a, a question about ISO 35001 and uh, to extent to which it addresses how BSL-4 facilities uh, need to be maintained. Uh, for example, um, if uh, U.S. BSL-4 labs that were built prior to 1980 require asbestos remediation. Would that be would that be covered? Um, and the um, I think mean, interesting thing about ISO 35001 is it does not specify biosafety standards directly because those are determined usually at the national level. And of course, there are also international guidance such as the WHO Laboratory Biosafety Manual. So the ISO 35001 does not specify exactly how biosafety is done in a particular lab. What does is it sets up a management system um, that um, uh, creates a process by which uh, every level of the lab has to address biosafety and biosecurity uh, requirements, whether they're in national guidance or they're in laws or, or in regulations. Um, and so to the extent that there are environmental health and safety issues uh, in a lab, then the ISO 35001 would incorporate those into how um, uh, biosafety is implemented in a laboratory. So if, if it needs to undergo, a lab needs to go, undergo remediation because of asbestos or there, some other you know, hazard in the lab, they would set up a process for here's how you assess the risk of this asbestos remediation. Here are the ways you can mitigate the risks um, to lab operations and to safety. And then a putting in process to evaluate implementation of those risk mitigation measures and a mechanism to then uh, you know, evaluate them and modify them over time to make sure that you are maximizing uh, safety while you're doing these other, these other things in a laboratory. So uh, what makes ISO 35001 appealing from our perspective is that because it, it's both international, you know, um, it, it's not created by any one country, there's an international group of experts that develop the standard. And because it does not get into the weeds about how any individual lab is supposed to use a glove box, or use an autoclave, um, it's applicable to a wide range of labs, not just BSL-4s, but also BSL-3s and 2s, or, or labs dealing other kinds of hazardous uh, materials. Uh, it puts in place uh, a management system that will um, put biosafety and biosecurity at the center of that lab's planning and leadership uh, and foster systems to make sure that um, biosafety and biosecurity risks are identified, are taken seriously, are mitigated, and there's a feedback mechanism to make sure those mitigation measures are working properly over time and modify them um, if, if they're not. So um, it, it provides a very kind of a broad, holistic, comprehensive way for labs to manage the risks posed uh, by their operations in terms of biosafety and biosecurity and put in place you know, procedures and policies and practices to make sure that those risks are being identified properly and being mitigated um, you know, the most uh, efficient way possible. Thanks, Greg. There's a question here about whether uh, we expect cuts to biosafety uh, labs funding in the near or long term in any countries due to suspicions about COVID-19. Um, I think our view is generally the opposite. 
that the pandemic has shown the need for biopreparedness. It has underscored that we need these sorts of safe Uh, I think we unfortunately just lost um, Philippa. Um, I will try and uh, step in and <laughs> uh, finish answering that question on her uh, behalf. Um, you know, we, we expect there to be an increase in the number of BSL-4 labs uh, and probably, you know, and BSL-3s as well uh, as countries prepare for the next pandemic and conduct research to either uh, identify potential zoonotic uh, risk pathogens or to um, develop you know, new diagnostics or medical kind of measures against potential pandemic uh, pathogens. So we expect this to be an area of growing interest by more countries you know, and more labs. And that is a major reason why we did the study in the first place to get a baseline in terms of BSL-4 labs around the world, but also the, the state of bio-risk management policies at the, at the laboratory level, at the national level, at the international level. And to the extent that we've identified gaps at all those levels, those guys will only become more important um, as more uh, of these labs come online. So this is the time for us to be developing international and national approaches to bio-risk management um, that will ensure that when these labs, you know, either current labs or new labs become operational, they will be operating as safely, securely, and responsibly as possible. Uh, I just want to address a question posed about um, international partnerships. Uh, between countries where biosafety, uh, biosafety and biosecurity standards and cultures might still be low and about um, the ability to monitor these partnerships. And, um, you know, this is definitely uh, an important area to, to keep an eye on because, you know, many of the diseases that pose potential pandemic threats or that pose, um, you know, epidemic threats uh, are located in uh, regions that do not have, you know, high levels of um, uh, BSL-4 uh, lab coverage, like in um, Southeast Asia and Africa and, and South America. And so these countries are obviously looking for international assistance to uh, build their capacity to identify pathogen threats and do the research needed to better understand them and to develop you know, defenses uh, against them. Um, and so understanding you know, what are the current capacities in these different countries and the kind of assistance they need, I think is valuable. Um, and making sure that uh, labs and countries that are doing this research, you know, have access to the right kinds of, of resources and expertise uh, and, and equipment and know-how to make sure they're doing this research um, safely, securely, and, and responsibly. Um, and there are different programs run by, um, by different countries, the U.S., Canada, the EU, um, to partner with countries uh, that have less resources in these areas to, um, uh, you know, give them access to the assistance they need to be able to operate in this space effectively. So this is something that is that is ongoing in, in many parts of the world and, and does uh, constitute an important part of global health security. Um, th there's also a, a couple of, of questions here about kind of the, the risks posed by um, BSL-4 labs. And, you know, one thing we, we wanna highlight is that uh, you know, th there are risks inherent with any kind of research in the life sciences when you're dealing with dangerous pathogens, right? The, the reason why research on these pathogens is needed is because they cause morbidity, mortality, uh, either in specific regions or as we see with COVID-19 globally, right? And we need to do the research in order to better understand how these pathogens work in order to develop medical countermeasures, diagnostics, um, uh, and, and uh, understanding the, the risk that these pathogens may evolve or may become more transmissible or be able to jump uh, from, from animals to, to humans. And so the BSL-4 labs are designed to work on those agents for which there are no existing medical treatments, there are no vaccines, and these pathogens can infect humans easily and spread uh, potentially person to person. Um, and that's why these, these high levels of biosafety are required to you know, reduce and minimize the risk that these pathogens, while they're being studied in a laboratory, could either infect the researcher uh, or escape the lab and cause community uh, infections. Um, and so it's not that these uh, labs are, um, uh, you know, posing a, a threat to, to biosafety and, and biosecurity, right? They're designed with, with, you know, to contain those naturally occurring threats that we do see, unfortunately, emerging ever so often. Uh, but 
as with all other kind of complex uh, endeavors, um, right, there are risks inherent in this kind of research that could result from human error, from equipment malfunctions. Um, and so uh, what we're advocating is, is greater international and national oversight over the safety and security of these labs to make sure that they are operating in accordance with the highest national and international standards for biosafety and biosecurity. Um, and uh, as I, as we noted before, in terms of the, the, the makeup of these labs, right, most of these labs are public health institutions or university labs that are doing, you know, academic, um, uh, academic research um, and don't have any, you know, affiliation with or, or connections to any, um, you know, biodefense uh, applications or, or military applications. Um, so I think there is some, um, you know, confusion about what these BSL-4 labs can do. Um, I think in, in many cases, the media does not help in that matter. And, and they focus on, you know, a handful of these labs and kind of sensationalize what, what's going on there, right? But overall, right, this, this biomedical research enterprise does an invaluable service for global health in terms of identifying, you know, risky pathogens, understanding them and developing defenses against them. Um, and at the same time, right, we need to balance the benefit we're reaping from these labs and the research they do with um, being able to mitigate the risks that are generated by that research, just by the nature of the fact you're dealing with these hazardous materials, hazardous pathogens um, that, that pose risks to both the people working in the labs and potentially the communities uh, around them. And you know, a big motivation for this study was to kind of put more of this information in the public domain in a way that would provide more um, transparency over uh, the nature of this um, research enterprise and understand the extent to which there are biosafety, biosecurity measures in place or where there are gaps and, and proposing ideas for filling those gaps. So we're, we're very uh, appreciative of, of the, you know, the great interest that's been taken in the website and our study. Uh, and we hope to you know, promote this discussion about uh, ways forward to enhance global health security uh, and uh, ensuring that these labs are operating as safely, securely and responsibly as possible. Um, I see Dr. Lensos has rejoined us after a brief power outage. Um, and since we are coming up against the, the end of our time, um, I, I will want to turn things over to her if she has any last words um, for our audience. Hi, everyone. My apologies. My laptop completely broke down on me and I'm now speaking to you from a different computer. So um, it was not at all my intention to, to leave you. And I'm glad to be back with you, um, even if very briefly. I'm sure um, both Greg and Joseph have been able to answer questions. Uh, in the meantime, there's one very last question here I'm just going to answer about how BSL-4 labs are used for diagnostic and how much of these labs are important for, so um, how are they, are, are these labs important for defensive purposes? Uh, they certainly are, we certainly know that in this forum. Um, one thing that we did want to highlight is that uh, less than um, one fifth of labs are defense labs, the vast majority of BSL-4 labs are public health uh, institutions. Um, there are more questions coming in, but uh, our time is now up. I would refer, refer you to our website as well as our policy brief. Um, and we are uh, all, of course, contactable through that email address that Joseph uh, highlighted at the bottom of our website. So please do uh, get in touch. Thank you very much for your attention today. It has been uh, good to engage with you. And uh, we hope to continue this conversation in this fora as well as in other fora. So with that, uh, thank you all very much and um, goodbye. Thank you.